Uh, good evening for the participants in India and good afternoon to the speaker. And um, I, I was going to say that the outside, and as the name suggests, is a way by which we provide an opportunity for the outside world to get to know what's going on in our labs. And uh, we've been doing this uh, uh, since the lockdown. And the topic of these webinar series has been on ecology. And uh, it is really meant to uh, you know, motivate and educate high school students and young adults. Or sometimes you, you also have people who are not so young, but uh, adults <laughs> join in. So we have had a huge variety of people. And uh, ever since uh, the June, we have had a, various, a series of topics and uh, people who are in the area have given a nice introduction to various topics in ecology. And uh, now since September, what we are doing is uh, to dwell on one topic at a time for a month. And we do this every Sunday. And I do have, a, um, I'm ably supported by co-hosts uh, and uh, the co-host for this month is Samir, uh, Dr. Samir Padhi from the Biology and Life Sciences. And he is specializing in freshwater uh, ecosystems. So he has uh, chosen uh, very nice uh, speakers for this month and uh, very good topics as well. Uh, so with this, uh, I would uh, request uh, Sammi to introduce the speaker, please. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce Professor David Britton. He's a professor of freshwater biology at the University of Plymouth. He has a wide range of expertise, specifically dealing with the uh, aquatic beetles. So usually when people uh, imagine beetles, they associate them living on land, but there are lots of beetles who also are aquatic. And Professor Bilton has an expertise in their systematics, taxonomy, ecology, and he has published extensively on, on those aspects. He has also described a lot of new species of uh, aquatic beetles. And it's a real pleasure to have you, Professor, giving this talk. So I would hand it over to you. Uh, Professor, you're not audible. Sorry, um, I should have uh, listened to the Zoom instructions earlier. Um, thanks very much, Samir. <laughs> thanks for the introduction, and thank, thanks to everyone for um, for, for the invite. It's a, it's a great pleasure to uh, be able to speak to you today. Or oh, um, I know it's evening with you. It's the uh, it's the morning with me. Um, so let me uh, initially get my um, my presentation up. Let me uh, share the screen. One second. There we go. Can you see that now? That should be there, yeah? Great. Yes. You're brilliant. Uh, it would help if I... You're getting a sneak preview now. <laughs> right, okay. So as I say, thanks very much for this opportunity. Um, as uh, Samir pointed out there, I've been working on water beetles for some considerable time. In fact, I've been interested in these insects since I was a child. Um, I'm not quite sure why I initially focused on these things, uh, probably because I liked a combination of being in water, being in fresh waters, and I always liked beetles. I've always been very fascinated by insects. Um, and what I'm going to do today is give you um, a bit of an overview of um, the different lineages of beetles which have colonized fresh waters from different terrestrial ancestors, and then pick up on two themes in ecology and evolution, which we've um, investigated recently, sort of using water beetles as a kind of model system to, uh, to try and understand these questions. Now, you'll notice I entitled my talk, An Inordinate Fondness for Water Beetles. And um, as it says in the, on the poster, it's really sort of paraphrasing a quote, supposed quote from the biologist JBS Haldane. And he was apparently asked by a clergyman what a lifetime of studying nature had told him about the mind of the creator. And Haldane pondered the, apparently pondered this for a moment or two, not very long at all, however, and his, his supposed response was that the creator, if he or she exists, must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles because they created so many of them. <laughs> 
And I, I, quite, I like this quote because it really emphasizes the fact that beetles are one of the dominant groups of organisms on our planet, certainly the dominant group of animals, if we think about them in terms of the number of species they have. And um, it also fits my sort of reason for being a biologist, really, and that I've always been fascinated uh, by these, these particular um, groups of insects. And um, what I want to try and do in the course of my talk is show you that as well as being intrinsically fascinating in their own right, these insects are really good models for sort of trying to understand some sort of broad questions in ecology and evolution. Now, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about, we summarized relatively recently um, in this review paper, it came out in 2019, um, so, uh, you know, just over a year ago, um, water beetles as models in ecology and evolution. And I like to think of these animals as being very good sort of, um, uh, you know, a very good group for testing a number of sort of ecological and evolutionary hypotheses. So from this paper, here's um, a phylogenetic tree, an evolutionary tree, a sort of simplified evolutionary tree of beetles, showing you in blue with these... Um, uh, uh, different sort of highlighted uh, lineages where the main groups of true water beetles are situated within the evolutionary radiation of beetles. Um, and one thing to note from this is that water beetles clearly don't form um, a single clade, they're not a single sort of um, evolutionary group. But what instead, different terrestrial ancestors have produced lineages of water beetles at different time points during the evolutionary radiation of the Coleoptera. So water beetles are really an ecological grouping rather than being a single lineage of beetles. You can see here, I think there's 10 major lineages which are primarily aquatic, which we believe of um, evolved this kind of aquatic habit, habit um, independently of each other. And the sort of insects at the top just give you some kind of indication of the range of morphologies. These aren't to scale, by the way. Um, you know, we, I had to sort of, um, you know, change the body size of these to get them to fit on the figure. Some of these are much, much smaller relative to each other than they, than they appear. But you see there that there's a, there's a wide range of morphologies of reflecting different sort of ways in which these things are adapted to aquatic life. So this sort of phylogeny, this evolutionary tree from our, our sort of summary paper focusing on the water beetles, it very much simplified and sort of reduced the, the, the diversity of other beetles. If we take instead a sort of an evolutionary tree, one of the most recent ones put together that attempts to include all the major lineages of beetle at sort of family level, this one from McKenna and colleagues in 2016, and we look at where water beetles are situated, we again get the same pattern in that the major lineages of water beetles that are primarily aquatic and I've indicated them here with these solid blue lines are scattered across the evolutionary radiation of some of these groups of beetles. Now I put this up to also point out that as indicated by these dotted lines is that within some beetle families in addition to these major aquatic families within other families which are largely terrestrial we also have radiations of aquatic or semi-aquatic beetles from within a, a generally terrestrial radiation. So in other words, in summary, water beetles are sort of scattered right across the evolutionary tree of beetles. We'll find um, at least 10 lineages which are primarily aquatic, but they've evolved from different terrestrial ancestors, many tens or in some cases hundreds of millions of years ago. And we also have within primarily terrestrial families, some examples of lineages, usually genera or, or tribes, you know, groups of related genera, which have again colonized the aquatic environment. So multiple transitions between terrestrial and aquatic life in beetles. And the only other insect order which I think um, approaches this in terms of the number of transitions to living in water is in the flies, in the diptera. And obviously in the flies, it's only really the larvae and in many cases the pupae, which are aquatic. Um, the, the, the adult phase is in, in almost all cases, there's a handful of species which deviate from this, but in almost all cases, the adult stage is, uh, is, is terrestrial. Whereas in the beetles, it's more common for both the larvae and the adult stage to be aquatic, sometimes having different niches, having diff occupying slightly different microhabitats, but still being in the water. You know, there are some beetles which follow the kind of fly model with an aquatic larva and a terrestrial adult, but the majority of aquatic beetles are 
are aquatic as larvae and as um, adults. And in terms of these sorts of transitions between land and water, the situation gets even more complicated if you start to look within lineages of aquatic beetles, because in many cases you find that there's been transitions back onto land and back into water again. So if we take the hydrophilids, for example, or so-called water-loving beetles, they're um, a radiation, relatively specious radiation of um, aquatic polyphaga. If we look at those as exemplified by these big uh, great silver beetles, as they're often termed in, uh, in, in English in terms of their common names, if we look within at this family's evolution, we can see that there've been multiple transitions between media. So if we think about the ancestor, um, this, this, this phylogeny is taken from uh, Martin Fikacek and colleagues' paper in 2012. I don't want to worry about the details of the gains and losses of trichobothria, which are basically sensory bristles on the backs of the beetles, but I want to just use it to emphasize the transitions between media. So if we think about the um, ancestral lineage leading to hydrophilids, leading to this family, that became aquatic from a terrestrial ancestor. Their closest living relatives are the hysteroids, which are terrestrial beetles feeding largely on fly larvae as both, um, as both adults and, um, and larvae, often found in dung, carrion, decaying material, often under bark where you find lots of fly larvae. Anyway, we had a transition into water, you know, an ancient transition to aquatic life in this lineage. And then if you look further down the phylogeny, you'll see that there's been a number of transitions back onto land as exemplified by these green branches. So we've had transitions back into terrestrial life within the genus Helophorus, this group of species. We've had these two um, taxa, um, these two related uh, genera uh, becoming, um, becoming terrestrial again. We've had within this group, within the Spheridiines, within this subfamily, this lineage, uh, again, a switch to terrestriality. And in some cases, as in at least twice within the Spheridiinae, these terrestrial taxa, which have come from an aquatic ancestor, have thrown off secondarily aquatic species again. So in many cases, this is probably the family which shows it to the, to the greatest degree, but we also see this kind of thing within other aquatic families, where you've had switches to land, switches back onto water. So in other words, multiple transitions between media within these, uh, these groups of beetles. And one of the things that the a study of water beetles can be intrinsically interesting for is sort of understanding the changes involved and the adaptations involved in switching between terrestrial and aquatic media and indeed back again and the kind of um, the kind of morphological physiological and behavioral adaptations these beetles have to develop in association with this and ourselves and others many many groups uh, many many um, uh, generations of people before us indeed, have, uh, have worked extensively on sort of gas exchange systems, for example, in, in aquatic beetles and how gas exchange systems in different kinds of habitat allow these beetles to do very, very different things. So going back to the, to the, to, to, to the general sort of um, diversity of water beetles, again, as you see from this slide, these are a range of um, different species, many of which were new to science when we first found them, which are from all from the Western Cape of South Africa, where we've um, discovered very high undescribed diversity of these beetles. And you can see just from the morphology that these things are really quite varied and represent as I've said, many transitions between land and water and have different ecologies in terms of the way they function and behave underwater. So some of these, such as the first three in this panel, uh, are predatory, both as larvae and adults. Others feed on detritus, others feed on algae, and many of them, the majority of the um, species shown in the bottom part of the panel here, as adults at least, feed on biofilms, feed on films of algae, diatoms and indeed bacteria and cyanobacteria, which are on the surface of rocks and stones, usually in stream habitats. And many of these, as you can see, the, the most extreme example being at your bottom right there, they have long legs with big claws to hold on, to hang on into the, in the current in some really fast flowing rivers. So the fact that you've got this ecological diversity means that this group of insects is really quite good for um, judging things like habitat quality and habitat type, and indeed classifying and evaluating the status of fresh waters. And the fact that they occur everywhere from the top of the highest mountains to salt marshes, and indeed in some cases, coastal rock pools, 
means that you can use water beetles to study the ecology and sort of conservation status and indeed general habitat quality of almost all inland waters. And that's true in almost all parts of the world. Obviously, the better known the fauna is, the easier it is to do this. But if you're looking at them at the species level, they can be really sort of sensitive indicators of conditions within waters, and the type of water, even the age of some of these habitats. You can get a handle on that from a study of their water beetle fauna. And again, the only other group which I think is equally diverse ecologically is the Diptera, which are aquatic as larvae, which are much more difficult to identify than adults. And they're generally much, much po more poorly known taxonomically and biologically, meaning their use as a sort of ecological indicator group is not as, as, as well developed, certainly not at the species level. But I'm not going to spend the rest of the time in this uh, talk considering the use of beetles as indicators. What I'm going to do is move on to some other kinds of themes that we've covered over recent years. So this overview slide here just picks out some of the kinds of uh, ecological and evolutionary um, questions or themes that we've addressed over the years looking at water beetles as a sort of model to sort of try and address some of these. And I'm going to focus first on one sort of related area. And that's the idea of sort of rarity, um, range size, biogeography, which also leads into sort of climate change uh, vulnerability, the vulnerability of species relative to each other to ongoing global change. But the overarching theme in this part of the talk really is trying to understand rarity, trying to understand this sort of general observation that most species on Earth are relatively rare in that they have relatively small populations and or relatively narrow, relatively small geographic ranges of occurrence. And this isn't something that's just true of water beetles, it's true of practically every group of organisms. And what I'm talking about here is not species that have become rare due to human activity, but species which are naturally rare, which have, you know, in the first place, their natural distribution and abundance are both relatively small or relatively low. So starting with what, so talking about water beetles, which I'm meant to be doing, um, one of the rarest water beetles is actually the largest. This thing, Megadytes ducalis, gets to nearly 50 millimetres in length, um, which, you know, it's, it's a pretty big beetle, really, by all accounts. Um, it overlaps in size with things like small terrapins, and it's also got really deep body. You know, it's a huge thing by a beetle standards. Now, for many, many years, this specimen here was the only known example of Megadytes ducalis in the world, and it sat in the shark collection in the Natural History Museum in London, and the only label on it was this, ducalis, Brazil, shark. Brazil, one of the biggest countries on earth, it doesn't particularly narrow it down so much, but we know that despite being very large, and so the kind of thing that would be very obvious and would attract attention, no more specimens were known until, this paper by Lars Hendrik and colleagues came out in 2019. And they entitled it The Return of the Duke, referring to Megadytes ducalis, because they were the first people to be able to give locality data for this beetle. But it turned out that um, the only other specimens in existence were hidden in collections in the Paris Museum that no one had really gone through in any detail, but they all were collected in the 19th century, like the type specimen in London, and they all came from one small area of the Brazilian Cerrado biome, this sort of semi-arid biome in, um, in, in this case, in south southeastern Brazil. And um, they showed that there were a number of other specimens in existence. Here's one specimen of Ducalis against two of the two other species, which are probably the two next biggest water beetles on Earth. So we know where this thing was, at least, is still listed as presumed extinct, but we have the possibility to try and go back and try and find it. But it's not just the small things which are rare. In the case of these diving beetles, whilst these two related species are relatively widespread in South and Central America, this thing's only known from one particular area of the Cerrado biome. Now, most water beetles clearly aren't anything like as big as this uh, Megadytes ducalis. They're relatively small in the order of a few millimeters in length. And this shot of uh, part of our reference collection shows you species of a particular genus and um, each sort of grouping of individuals represent a separate species. 
So you can see here on this on the on this top row here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, etc. Different distinct species, and you can see like many insects, indeed many other animals and plants and fungi that we look at, superficially these things within a particular genus look very, very similar to each other. Now, if we look within a genus like this or within any closely related grouping, we find that whilst the species may look relatively similar, they often differ dramatically in their biogeography, in their relative abundance and their relative range size. So in the case of this genus, Derinectes, it's largely a, a European and Western to Central Asian group with also some taxa in North Africa. If we look at this um, Derinectes genus, here's from a paper we uh, produced in 2016. Here's the distribution in different shading of different species groups. So these aren't individual species, they're individual groups of related species within that genus. And you'll see that there's distinct sort of patterns here that different species groups are found in different areas. You'll also see that some species groups are relatively widespread, like this Parvicollis group, which gets right into the, um, to the, to the western edge of the Himalaya, um, where some species groups, such as the uh, Moestus group um, the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Platinotus group, uh, are more restricted. They're restricted to particular areas of Europe. If we drill down and look in a bit more detail and look at individual species, what we find is that within the genus, and this is a pattern we see in most groups of related animals, there are very few widespread species. So in Derinectes diving beetles, the most widespread species we have, what we know of, is Derinectes latus, which as you see in this relatively crude map from the black squares there, is distributed everywhere. It's a European species, but it's distributed everywhere from um, just into Greece here, in the south of Europe, right up to the northern parts of Scandinavia, well within the Arctic Circle. Its two closest relatives, which morphologically look very, very similar to it, but we know on a number of characters and also on genetic data, they are distinct separate species, are Angelini and Angusi. Angelini is found in Italy, south of the Po Plain. So it's basically a species of the Italian peninsula and into um, Sicily there. And Angusi is only found in some mountains in this area of northern Spain. So we can sort of start to ask the question, what is it about lattice which makes it much, much more widespread than its relatives, which live in the same kind of habitat, are apparently very, very similar morphologically and ecologically, and also we know from the genetic data, very closely related, and they sort of evolved from each other relatively recently. If we look at other species within the genus, which is within this sort of bicostatus grouping, we find that their attacks are restricted to individual parts of Southern Europe, in this case, parts of um, Spain and Portugal, or indeed individual mountain ranges in Southern Europe, such as this one, Depressicollis, which is only found in some of the Sierras, some of the mountains of um, the most Southern regions of, of, uh, of, of Spain, of Central Spain. We find as well within the genus, there are some such as this thing, Algibensis, which are almost what we term point endemics, in that they're only found in single small areas. This thing is found in um, you know, a handful of streams in basically one mountain system just north of the Straits of Gibraltar. This is the kind of habitat we find it in, with in this case sort of remnants of, uh, sub, almost remnants of subtropical vegetation, which would have been much more widespread in Europe before the onset of the Ice Ages. And this is quite a nice locality to visit, lots of other interesting um, aquatic animals present there. So we see this huge range of variation in geographical range size, most species having relatively small ranges and some like lattice becoming really, really widespread. And as I said, this isn't something that's restricted to water beetles by any means. It's something which has been recognized very widely in the ecological literature for a long period of time. These are three plots, um, three uh, bar graphs taken from uh, Kevin Gaston's uh, summary in, in 2004. And three, which is on sort of looking at, at rarity and patterns in species distribution. We've got cats, freshwater fishes, water birds, slightly different ways of estimating geographical range size here, but we've got the same pattern in every case. Large numbers of species having relatively small geographical range sizes, and then this tail off to relatively few species which are more widespread. 
And you can see that this is numbers of rivers. This is some measure of range size in terms of the, the number of sort of major sort of grid cells on a, on a, on a map which are occupied. But you can see the pattern's the same. And it, it, it's a real generality ecologically. Most things are relatively rare with relatively small range sizes and relatively small population sizes. And a handful within that related group of organisms will be much, much more widespread. So we and others were interested in sort of trying to understand what kind of factors drive this pattern. We wanted to understand it within these water beetles that we were studying. So if we think about it, referring back to our Derinectes again, our small diving beetles, although these kind of things, as I said, can apply to many, many groups of organisms, the kinds of mechanisms that might drive these differences we see in the size of the geographical range might be, for example, how old taxa are, how long they've been around, how good they are at getting about, the relative dispersal ability, and lastly, their sort of fundamental niche breadth, how the range of conditions over which they can survive, because all of these could have consequences for how widespread or restricted a species is. Um, so if we think about these in turn, just to sort of think about how they actually operate, if we think about evolutionary age, the idea here would be all else being equal, older species, we might expect to have um, larger geographical ranges because all else being equal, they've had longer time to expand. You know, if you think of something that evolved uh, 10 million years ago compared to something which evolved, you know, an individual species that evolved 1 million years ago, if they have the similar niche breadth, similar dispersal abilities, the one that evolved 10 million years ago, theoretically at least, has had more time to get about, so we'd expect it to be more widespread. So if that's the case, if we have a phylogeny here, an evolutionary tree, or an attempt to reconstruct an evolutionary tree from genetic data, we might expect there to be some kind of positive relationship between the sort of branch length on this tree, you know, how long ago something separated from its, its relatives, and the relative size of the geographic range. Taking the next of these kind of things, these kind of drivers, uh, dispersal ability, how good things are at getting around. Again, all else being equal, we might expect better dispersers to have bigger ranges. So this is a, a, um, the, the beetle in the photograph taken by my friend, Jeff Nobes. It's one of the few people who's managed to get a picture of these things in flight. Um, it's a beetle called Rantus suturalis, which it's um, sometimes been nicknamed the super tramp. Because this beetle, despite apparently evolving in the highlands of New Guinea, has spread everywhere from New Zealand to the Azores. And we think it's got almost everywhere naturally. So it's gone right through the, the Oriental and Palearctic region in a sort of westerly direction and got to these islands in the middle of the Atlantic. And on the other direction, it's got down through Australia into, um, into New Zealand. So it's one of the most widespread species of um, water beetle, indeed freshwater um, insect on Earth. Um, so this thing, we think, well, we practically know, is an extremely good disperser. And if we're thinking about relative dispersal ability, the relative size of a beetle's wings compared to its body size is often a good marker of how good that is at dispersing. If you've got relatively big wings, it means you've got a um, uh, relatively big sort of surface of those wings to carry the load of your body in flight. And it tends to be correlated with, um, with a sort of big range and high dispersal ability. But, you know, thinking of our drivers, the second one of these is dispersal ability. If you're better at getting around compared to your relatives, all else being equal, we'd expect you to have a bigger geographic range. Now, the third possible sort of class of driver is basically to do with fundamental niche breadth. And this, these sort of ideas were first really articulated in, in, in any detail in this paper by Jim Brown and, uh, in 1984, where he's looking at the relationship between abundance and distribution. And the idea here is the broader the niche, the broader the range of conditions over which a species may be able to survive, the bigger the geographic range, because it encompass a greater range of uh, localities. Now, there we've got Three possible drivers, evolutionary age, how long a species has been around, relative dispersal ability, and fundamental niche breadth, the range of conditions over which it can potentially um, survive and reproduce. And despite these kind of drivers of relative range size being put forward for decades, there have been virtually no attempts to empirically test 
the relative importance of these different drivers before we started working on this group of water beetles. So what we tried to do with these Derinactes is rather than just compare a rare and common species, just one rare and one common species, and rather than just look at one of these drivers like evolutionary age or relative wing size or um, uh, some kind of measure of niche breadth, we tried to encompass all of these different drivers in a single study to look at their relative importance. So for the estimates of evolutionary age, we had a phylogeny or a reconstruction of phylogeny uh, generated from uh, molecular data, a mix of nuclear and mitochondrial gene sequences, which we could use to control for the effect of relatedness in our analysis to see the extent to which this kind of effect influenced range size. For dispersal ability, we had a measure of relative wing size, so we had wing length, body length ratios in the case of these um, Derinectes beetles. And in the case of niche breadth, what we focused on in particular was thermal physiology. We're looking at temperature tolerance and the ability to acclimate to previous exposures to warm and cold temperatures. So going into this niche breadth thing in a little bit more detail, because it's, um, it, it was relatively novel, what we basically did was we took relatively large numbers as many, if we could, up to 80 individuals per species, and we first acclimated them for a week at two different temperatures, both of which were within the range they'll experience, but one which is relatively stressful, 20 degrees, stressful but not lethal, and one which is more within the norms of what they experience of 15 degrees. And then what we did from each of these acclimation groups is we looked at the upper thermal tolerance and the lower thermal tolerance as UTT and LTT. So we had relatively large numbers where we estimated their upper lethal limits and their lower lethal limits. And because we acclimated them at two different temperatures, we could also look at the effect of acclimation, the effect of previous exposure to relatively warm and more benign, more, more average, more ambient kinds of temperatures. And so if we think about our widespread and restricted species, as exemplified by this species pair, Lattus and Angusy, we can make specific predictions of what we might expect if temperature tolerance, if this aspect of the sort of fundamental niche of the organism, its physiological niche, was having an impact on range size. We might expect restricted species to have a narrower thermal range than widespread species. Here you can see the thermal range from the um, upper thermal limit to the lower thermal limit is 20 degrees. Here you can see in the widespread, the thermal range, the total thermal span of these things, if you like, is 40 degrees. So we might expect widespreads to have a greater sort of range of survival ability over the temperature range. We might also expect widespread species to be better at acclimating to previous exposure. So, you know, as I was saying before, if we keep them at two different temperatures, temperature one, which is relatively benign, and temperature two, which is a bit stressful, our 15 and 20 in our experiments, if we look at the change in UTT or delta UTT, we might expect it to be relatively small for our restricted, but bigger for our widespread. In other words, it's got sort of more plasticity of those thermal limits. It can acclimate more readily. It's not an adaptation because it's not reflecting change over generations, but it's a sort of plasticity within individuals. They can sort of respond to being exposed and sort of harden in terms of their response to, in this case, warm but alternatively cold temperatures. So if we integrate these different aspects in our study, what we find in Derinectes, and we found similar things in other genera of water beetles, if we look within a single genus living in the same kind of habitat, either running or standing, is that thermal range is the best predictor of biogeography. So here we've got plots of lat latitudinal range extent, LRE at the top there on the y-axis versus thermal tolerance range for our different species. And that's a strong, there's a strong positive relationship there. At the bottom, we've got latitudinal range central point. So that's how far north or south the whole range is situated. And again, that's related positively to thermal tolerance range. So in other words, the range of temperatures over which a species can survive is the best predictor of its geographical range. And what we think is driving this is that the species which are really widespread have been able to retain their southern populations as climate warmed at the end of the last ice age, but also been able to expand north through a combination of high tolerance to cold temperatures and high tolerance to warm temperatures. They have a big range over which they can survive. We've also found with these beetles as well, that 
upper thermal tolerance limits, you know, the absolute upper thermal limit uh, is correlated positively with their ability to acclimate these limits. So their ability to switch in response to exposure. And here we've got um, some figures from a, a paper we produced way back in 2008. We don't see the same kind of relationship with the lower temperature limits, but we see it with the upper temperature limits. Now, if you think about it, on this plot here, if we go from uh, our relatively low upper thermal limits to our relatively high upper thermal limits on the x-axis, that also spans from relatively rare to relatively common species. So the species which are going to be most vulnerable to ongoing climatic warming are the rare species which are already restricted to these sort of montane refugia in southern parts of, of the Palearctic region, southern parts of Europe in particular. So as climate warms, these things are doubly threatened because one, they're threatened because their habitat moves up the mountain. You know, their permanent cold, relatively cold streams move up the mountain, they become smaller in extent, and eventually they potentially disappear off the top of the mountain. There's nowhere else to go. But they're also threatened physiologically because um, they have relatively low upper limits and also low plasticity of those limits. They can't acclimate very well to these temperature changes. So that's a bit um, of the talk about large scale sort of biogeography, macroecology, macrophysiology, and sort of drivers of relative range size. And what we found here, the take home message really, was that to be widespread, these beetles needed relatively wide thermal tolerance limits, which would allow them to occupy a wide range of different latitudes. And so retain southern populations where they'd lived during ice ages, but also expand north. Whereas the ones which didn't have good heat tolerance, they, the whole range would have to move north. I want to switch to something completely different really now, um, different um, in every respect, probably apart from it deals with um, water beetles. And that's this area of, um, of, of sexual conflict. Um, so to start this part of the talk, uh, here's a pair of Acilius sulcatus, a sort of medium sized uh, Eurasian diving beetle pairing up. It says there they're mating, um, Mating is only one part of this pairing process. The males and females will stay attached to each other for, in the case of this species, a couple of hours. Um, there'll be a period of pre-mate guarding by the male, then mating, actual you know, insemination, and then a period of post-mate guarding. And that period can take, as I say, a couple of hours um, with a small window in the middle when they're actually mate, truly mating. Okay. Now, if we think about this pairing process, um, the, the, the sort of morphology and, and behavior of these beetles when they're with diving beetles when they're mating uh, has been has, has a long history of study. And it goes back to um, before Darwin, but Darwin in the descent of man and selection in relation to sex, you know, his other great evolutionary work after the origin of species, um, spent a bit of time referring to these beetles. And um, there's a direct quote from Darwin there, which I'll, I'll read out. He says, the tarsi of the front legs are dilated in many male beetles or are furnished with broad cushions of hairs. And in many genera of water beetles, they're armed with a round flat sucker so that the male may adhere to the slippery body of the female. You know, so they've got to be um, relatively smooth and streamlined uh, to be sort of hydrodynamic in the water. It is a much more unusual circumstance, he goes on to say, that the females of some water beetles, and in brackets he gives one of the genera, have their elytra deeply grooved, and in Acilia sulcatus, which is the one we had the photo of a few minutes ago, um, thickly set with hairs, and he says that they're there as an aid to the male. So again from uh, Burston and Miller's paper, let's look at these um, structures. So we've got the mating pair of Acilia sulcatus in the middle, the male on top, the female below. Um, you'll see inset at the top left, uh, a view with a light, um, a, a light micrograph of the, um, the underside of the foot of the male acilius. And you can see that as well as these sort of spines and hairs around the edge of the foot, it's got a series of big, big and small suckers 
on the underside of the foot that it uses to attach to the female. The female, the uh, tarsi, the whole of the foot are about as thick as this joint at the top. You know, they're not expanded like this and they certainly don't have anything like these suckers. Even these small things you see around the edge and there's numerous ones that are there, they're small suckers. They're all little attachment devices evolved from uh, a modified bristle. You know, they have a distinct shaft and a distinct sort of plate like a suction cup on, their, on the end of them. If you look at the female, these are the grooves and hairs that Darwin was referring to. You can see there's grooves and then these the furrows, which are heavily punctured and they're furnished with hairs. And Darwin interpreted these as being an aid to the male. Now, if you think about this from the physics of suction, these are anything but an aid to the male. These are actually functioning in exactly the opposite manner. What these ridges and furrows and hairs are doing is making it harder for the male to hang on with the modifications on his front legs and his middle legs that he uses to initially attach to the swim female when she's swimming around in the water and then to hold on during this pairing process. And what we think is happening is basically there's like an arms race going on over control of paternity between the males and females in these beetles. Females are more choosy, males are less choosy because of their differential investment in gametes, something that's common across a lot of the animal kingdom. Also in these beetles, mating or pairing is much more costly to a female than it is to a male. The female, when they're paired up like this, she's doing all the swimming. She's basically carrying the male around, which itself is energetically costly. Also, the male, when they surface to exchange their air stores under their wing cases, the male doesn't always let the female exchange air. He keeps her in what we'd consider a sort of tired, um, partly anaerobic state, which again has a metabolic cost to it in an attempt to try and stop her shaking him off. So there's this kind of arms race going on. Females develop these rough sculptured surfaces. Male develops the, males develop these countermeasures. Countermeasures res get response from females and you get this kind of cir 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 cyclical sort of reciprocal evolution of these characters. So rather than being an aid to the male, as, um, as Darwin predicted, these are exactly the opposite. This is one of the occasions where the great man got it wrong, we're afraid, um, and that, that, that these function in exactly the opposite manner. Going on to Darwin's quote, he says, the females of some other water beetles, hydrophorus, have their elytra punctured for the same purpose. So they're heavily set with sort of little sort of depressions on the surface. And he also has a footnote and he says, we have a curious and inexplicable case of dimorphism for some of the females of certain species of hydrophorus, have their elytra smooth and no intermediate gradations between the sulcated or punctured and the quite smooth elytra have been observed. So it's referring here to within a species, you have females being smooth like the male or rough, and sometimes in the same population in some species or in other times in different populations. And what I want to go on to spend a little bit more time talking up to before I finish, because I do have to stop at some point, is some study we, we did um, relatively recently on one of these species that Darwin was referring to, this thing, Hydroporus memnonius. So it's a relatively widespread species in, in Europe and Western Asia, um, and it occurs in specific kinds of habitats, so sort of these kind of cold pools that are um, where a tree's fallen, in this case, that are full of dead leaves, or in these sort of areas which you get cold water on the edges of mosses and bogs, where you've got sort of groundwater inflow. If we look at it in the British Isles, where its distributions um, are best known, it's a really widespread species. It's not one of the commonest water beetles, but it's everywhere from right up in the, known everywhere from right up in the Shetlands, right down to uh, Land's End and the Scilly Isles, throughout um, England, Wales and Scotland and, and throughout Ireland. Now, what's interesting about Hydrophorus memnonius is that if we look at the females, their appearance, we have some females which are shining and appear very, very much like males. And really, until you sort of study them in detail under the microscope, you can't be certain what sex you've got in the field. To others, which look remarkably different. And these have been termed this variety castaneous, because they're sometimes more chestnut coloured, more sort of brownish in appearance as well, or more obviously brown in appearance, because they have this dull surface. And if we look at the distribution of these forms, we find that they're relatively distinct in terms of where they're found. If we look at them outside the British Isles, we find that this castaneous, this form with the mat female, is mainly central in terms of its distribution, you know, throughout sort of central Europe, France, uh, Germany, um, parts, of, parts of Eastern Europe. And the mat, the shining female form is peripheral. 
We find it's the only form you get in Scandinavia, in, um, and in Fenescandia, indeed in Finland and uh, Sweden and Norway. It's the only form we find in the Iberian Peninsula, in Spain and Portugal, the only form we find in Southern and Central Italy, and the only form we find in the Southern Balkans. If we look within the British Isles where we've got better data from our excellent recording scheme for water beetles, there's a real distinct divide between the occurrence of these two taxa. It seems that, um, that, that, that the map form, for example, doesn't like Scotland. So if we look at the distribution, the shining form is found throughout most of Scotland, right up into the Shetlands. It's the only form we found in, in, in Ireland. It's also found on the Scilly Isles, parts of West Wales, uh, Anglesey, and the only form found on the Isle of Man, also in parts of West Cumbria. If we look at the mat form, it's the only form throughout much of England and Wales, um, but it doesn't penetrate so far into Scotland, isn't found on these outlying islands. And interestingly, although it's found right on the southern tip of Cornwall here, where you can see these Scilly Islands from, it's not on the Scilly Isles, but the shining form is. So we wanted to study these and we wanted to look initially at what made shining females shining, what made matte females matte, and were there any differences in the males associated with those females? Because if this difference in sculpture is um, influencing the sort of mating abilities of males, we might expect there to be male countermeasures to these appearance of these rough females. So we looked at the sculpture of the female's surface using electron microscopy on the thorax and on the top of the wing cases, which are the bits where the male legs grab when these things are trying to pair up. And what we found is that the reason why these things are matte is through a modification of the reticulation, the sort of network of scratches, the sort of mosaic of scratches on the microscopic surface of the wing cases and the thorax. This shows the thorax and the wing cases side by side for shining females, matte females and males. And you can see that shining females, the sculpture is very, very similar to what we find in males. But matte females, what's happened is firstly, these little sort of polygons of the reticulation are a bit smaller. Secondly, these channels between them are broader and they're deeper. And thirdly, each individual sort of polygon with the reticulation is a little bit domed. Right? Whereas in the shining female and the males, it's almost entirely flat. So there's quite a distinct way in which females have become rough in their sculpture. They've basically modified the reticulation which is present ancestrally in these beetles and, and, and sort of changed it to make them a bit more rough in terms of their surface. And it gives them this matte or dull appearance at the sort of macroscopic scale and to the naked eye. If we look at the males, if we look at their foretarsi and their midtarsi, you know, their front and middle feet, we find that the underside of their feet is furnished with a series of suckers. And in the case of these Hydroporus memnonius, there are two distinct classes of suckers. There's a series of small suckers, which are mainly distributed around the outside of the tarsal segments and on these later tarsal segments. And then there are these large suckers, which are distributed in the center, mainly of this first tarsal segment. These, uh, you can see the holes here are where suckers have fallen out and from this, or being pulled out of this individual during the course of its life. So there would have been suckers all around where these holes are, they've been small suckers. But you can see these large suckers have these really distinct sort of suction cups on the end that are sort of shaped a little bit like a scoop. Female feet, in contrast, just have these small sucker hairs. So this is the underside of the same um, bit of the leg uh, the same bit of the front leg of a female Hydroporus memnonis, and it lacks these big suckers completely. Now, if we look at males associated with um, um, shining and matte female populations of this beetle, we find that the feet look dramatically different. So at the top here are two shots um, just to show different aspects of the same foot of uh, males associated with shining females. And you can see these big suckers are relatively sparse, and relatively small in terms of the surface area of individual sucker plates. Compare that to the males associated with the mat females. You've got a denser pack of suckers. And you've also you've got more of them, but they're also individually bigger. You know, the, the actual sort of diameter of these suckers is significantly bigger than these ones. The other thing that happens is these big suckers aren't just restricted to this first foot segment. They're also on this middle foot segment here. You can see them, these two here which are never present in males associated with these shining females. So as well as there being this difference in females, it turns out 
When we look at these populations which are only matte or shining, the males also differ. And we think that's happened in response to being able to attach to these rougher females. They've upped the game, up their sort of escalated their arms race in terms of being able to hold on to these individuals. So in summary, shining and castaneous females differ in their articulation, which makes it harder in the case of castaneous for males to attach to them. The males associated with them have differences in both the distribution and size of these large suckers, which we think in the males associated with castaneous are an adaptation to enable it to more easily attach to this rougher surface. Now, as well as being more easily able to attach to this rougher surface, Males that have these large suckers and have more of these large suckers that are also bigger, so they've got more suction ability, would also be better at sticking to these smooth females. So the male that's evolved in response to this female sculpture, we would expect it also to be better at hanging on and potentially mating with shining females as well as these rough ones. If we look at the distribution again of the two forms in Britain, given this sort of increased mating ability, increased attachment ability of the male associated with the rough female, we might expect the rough form and its associated male to expand at the expense of the shining form, just through this different sort of um, attachment ability. So what we did to test this was we examined populations in the transition zone between smooth and, and, um, and rough uh, forms of Hydropus memnonius. And we looked at these populations, which sort of span the border uh, between England and Scotland. Because in the case of these populations, we had data from the 1970s and 1980s as to the status of these forms, of the, the, these populations. The open circles indicate shining females only, the closed circles indicate matte females only, and the half and half, these few populations in the Scottish borders here, indicate cases where we found a mixture of the two types in the 1970s and 1980s. So we knew that was sort of like the leading edge of the transition zone between them. So what we did was we used the data we had from these populations in the 70s, but mainly the 80s. And then I went back in 2007 to 8 and collected these beetles again from the same localities. And we looked what had happened over time in terms of the relative frequency and the sort of um, status of these populations. And what we found was that the majority of them had switched, had, had, had changed in a way that was in the direction of the matte female. You know, mixed populations have become matte or shiny populations have become mixed, suggesting that there'd been a spread of these, um, these, these matte forms at the expense of the shiny form. Only one population had gone the other way. And so it was really significant result, statistically speaking, that there'd been apparently an expansion of this matte form and its associated male at the expense of the shiny form and its associated male. And we came to the conclusion that the matte form had expanded significantly in around about 30 years. You know, if we think of this as sort of being the, the sort of transition zone between these two, these two types of this beetle, it had shifted north and west to a significant degree, a slight but significant degree over the course of this time period. And the reason we think this, is happen this has happened um, has nothing to do, we think, with changes in climate that might have happened over this time period. If we think about the distribution of the two forms in Europe as a whole, it isn't that one's northern and one's southern, or one's in cold climates and one's in warm climates, it's that one's central and one's more peripheral. So we have the shining form in both the south and the north of the range in Europe and the matte form in the middle. And if we look within the British Isles, where there's this sort of transition zone, we look at the populations either side and look at their thermal biology in a similar way to what I talked about with Derenectes. There's virtually no difference between them. Certainly not the kind of difference which you'd expect to drive some kind of expansion of one form versus the other. So we think it's down instead to this interaction between the sexes. And if you think about it, from e the perspective of either sex, the spread of matte females and associated males would favor the, um, the spread of the alternative sex. If you think about a population um, being colonized by matte females, that would put 
males associated with the shining female at an even greater disadvantage in terms of being able to hold on to the female and would advantage males associated with the castaneous form. If you think about it from the point of view of males interacting with females from the female perspective, if you start to get a high density of um, these, these uh, males with more bigger suckers, shining females would be at a disadvantage because they'll be unable to shake these males off and so be prone to increased numbers of matings, which as I've explained in the case of the acilius there, can have a sort of lifetime fitness cost that would favor matte females over shining females. So whichever sort of perspective you look at it from, we think that what's happening as these two forms come into interaction is it favors the spread of the matte female and the associated male, which we think this is one of the, we, as far as we know, this is the first case in any organism where we think there's a distributional shift occurring and a population replacement occurring due to the dynamics of sexual selection and sexual conflict. So I hope, I'm gonna, gonna sort of round up in a minute or two, I hope over the course of this, um, this talk, you've gained a bit more of an insight into the diversity of water peoples, a bit more of an insight into why people like me have sort of been fascinated with them for, for so many years, and also um, an insight into some of the kinds of ecological and evolutionary ideas and, 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 and sort of themes that these beetles can be, um, can be fascinating to study. Um, with regard to. So I hope I've um, given you something to think about, hope you found it interesting, which is the main thing, because I certainly do find it interesting personally. So I hope that's got across. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just put up an acknowledgement slide as you do to thank the people and, and, and occasionally funding bodies that have been involved in, uh, in, in this work, and I'll, and I'll stop there. And thanks very much for listening. Hi, uh, so okay. uh, I guess we, for right now, our audience uh, has been absorbing the information and we have one question, which um, Samir, you want to talk about it? I, I'm not sure uh, how easy it would be to identify this species based on just this tiny description. Uh, that, you want to yeah. ask Professor Bilton or we can ask the person who asked the question maybe. Yeah, yeah, go um, on, yeah. Adrit, very uh, difficult, go, I think, but yeah, Adrit, go ahead and ask your question, maybe. Uh, I saw this uh, green and gold water beetle that was like three millimeters, and I'm wondering what species it might be. Difficult to be honest. Um, was it swimming or was it crawling? Uh, it was swimming. Okay. Um, I mean, my guess, if it's if it, my guess, if it's sort of greenish gold, obviously, and, and uniformly greenish gold, and that size, it might be one of the swimming hydrophilids. So it might be um, it might be something like um, Regimbartia or something like this. But um, I mean, I'm not as familiar with the. I must admit, I'm not as familiar with the Indian fauna um, as I am with the fauna of uh, some other parts of the world. I'm afraid, but my guess. Is, it would be one of these hydrophilids, you know, the family I was talking about that sort of make those multiple transitions between land and water. But, but realistically, from a, without an image, without a picture, it's very, very difficult. Because another thing that happens in, in water beetles is a lot of them can end up being um, uh, morphologically quite similar to each other because they've got to be hydrodynamic, you know, they've got to be able to sort of move around through the water. So sorry not to be of much more help. It the short answer is I don't know. It was a uh, kind of strange. Like for example, uh, I captured it for the while to see uh, its activity. I planned to release it back. Uh, so uh, when I uh, gave it the proper habitat, like this jar full of water and a few dripping yeah, yeah. places in case needed, it just sank down and then rose up, sank down, rose up, uh, and that activity kept on going. So if it's going back and forth to the surface, that'll be it exchanging its air store. I mean, it kind of like uh, uh, slept on the bottom and then it came up and we did something and then sank back. Yes, that's what it'll be doing, I think. It'll be going up to get air. All right. <laughs>
because as they use the oxygen, they have either a bubble under their wing cases or some, in some cases that bubble extend, extends onto the underside. It's held in place by hairs, so it looks silvery. And as it uses up oxygen, it can sometimes get a bit more oxygen out of the water, but then it eventually has to surface to exchange the gas. Okay, thank you very much. No problem. Thanks. Hi, Adrit. Uh, may I know your age and which school you're from? I'm seven, I mean, eight years old. Okay. And I'm homeschooled, which means that I study at home. Okay, very good. Which part of the country you're from? Uh, Bangalore. Okay, excellent. Thank you for joining us and asking that question. I think um, maybe uh, there are some resources you could use to identify, uh, you know, the beetles around you. Uh, maybe I can we can try and share those with you later. Um, uh, so, Damani, you had a question about uh, amphibian water beetles. Water yeah, water I, I, I was wondering whether we have just like how we have water beetles, do we also have amphibian beetles? Yeah, I mean, you have, you certainly have species which are aquatic only in one life stage for a start. Mm. So you mm. have species which are, you have some which are aquatic as larvae and then terrestrial as adults. Mm -hmm. um, some families which, which the, where the whole family does that. You mm -hmm. have others where they're, they're ter supposedly terrestrial as larvae and then aquatic as adults. Although I suspect there, in those cases, the larvae are actually amphibious in that they're living right on the water margin. So they're almost okay. living in the meniscus. And you have quite a lot of beetles which live on that sort of, on that water margin, particularly in running waters. You'll mm -hmm. find them either just under the water or just above the water, and mm -hmm. they'll move between the two. All right. So yeah, in a sense, I think, yes, you do. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have another Any question. More questions? Yeah, we have uh, one more from an anonymous attendee. Um, so the question is, is there a similar sexual conflict in terrestrial beetles as well? There is, yeah. There's, there's these kind of things going on in a lot, in a lot of groups. But as far as I know, the, the particular sort of, if you like, pre-mating kind of conflict that goes on in, in diving beetles, you don't really get that to the same extent um, in terrestrial beetles. And I think it's because the, the way in which the female tries to resist the male is by really strong swimming, um, which, can, which can sort of shake him off. Um, and, and that's not really, you know, that's not as easy to do in, in air, clearly. So I don't know of any cases where it's the same, but there are cases where similar things happen after they've actually mated, you know, in terms of the, the, the gametes that come into, in terms of determining whether the gametes come together. Okay, uh, I think that uh, we have a shy audience today. They don't have a lot of questions. <laughs> I uh, had a in question. Case anybody want? Professor. Yeah. 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 So what I wanted to ask was, uh, how much or interpopulation variation as far as genetics go has been studied with beetles? Is it very high for the widely dispersed species? Interpopulation, yeah. The, um, the population, it, varies, yeah. it varies quite a lot. So in some, spe in some species, um, even some of these widespread, some of these widespread species, there's relatively limited um, genetic variation okay. between populations. It depends on how, okay. I think, it generally would correlate with how good they are at birthing. But the other, the other okay. issue we, we have in general with the sort of data that are available is a lot of the work that's been done in that regard is looking within areas which have been formerly glaciated. So you wouldn't expect there to be much variation in them anyway, you know what I mean? Because they're, they're probably right. stemming right. from a sort of colonising um, a colonizing population which itself was relatively um, limited in variation so you right. tend to have large areas where they're relatively uniform now when right. when people have looked at these more southern populations as well there's more diversity in these southern populations which have been um, which have had uh, you know more more uh, continuity of occurrence you know they've been refugial populations during glacials and the thing is in okay. in um, in the in the tropics there's not as much, there's not as many studies. I mean, the only ones which immediately spring to mind are studies of, of taxa in places like New Guinea, 
um, where there's been evidence, there's been suggestion that some of these things are cryptic species complexes. Okay. On the basis of genetic diversity between populations in right. different mountain ranges. But, okay. you know, it's, it's difficult, it's difficult to then, you know, to then be sort of thinking, are these really different species or are they just populations right. that have reflected long periods of isolation? And I guess, again, that comes really to partly depending on what species concept you want to use. Right. Okay. okay. Yeah, I don't thank know whether that helps. But... It, it should. Thank you. Thanks. Does anyone have any more questions? Uh, you can, as Pavitra said, you can maybe type the questions <clears throat> if you are not able to ask. So there's uh, one more question in the Q&A box. Um, Samir, you want me to read it out? Yeah, sure. So the question is, how does the temperature acclim acclim acclimation occur? Are there changes? Are the changes behavioral or physiological? Uh, we think they're <clears> physiological. <throat> So in the case of these derinectes that we studied, we haven't looked at the, um, in the case of these, we haven't looked at the sort of molecular mechanism, but in some of the other things, we, we have looked at that. And um, we think what it is, is they're upregulating the, uh, the sort of transcription of certain proteins, which are these things that are, that, are, that are generally termed heat shock proteins. Although the termed heat shock proteins, but they will be upregulated in response to lots of different kinds of stresses. At the, at the sort of biochemical level. And what they do, we think, is they act as, um, as um, sort of chaperones that maintain the structure of enzymes under extremes. So in response to both low and high temperatures, we think what happens is they upregulate the, the production of some of these proteins, which then can sort of stabilize the, the sort of metabolic machinery of the cells. So we think that's one of the main thing that's happening in not in these derinectes, but in some um, agabus, another genus of diving beetle that's a bit bigger, so easier to study in that regard. Um, we, we'd, we'd investigated this, and it seems that they're they're able to do this, and that's a very very common way of acclimating in 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 lots of animals, not just not just water beetles by any means. So we think that's one of the main ways they do it. The other thing that some of them can do is they can survive freezing. Or, or at least go well below the freezing point by increasing the sort of osmotic concentration of their intracellular fluids. So you can drop these beetles down to well below zero in air and they don't freeze. They have a, they have a sort of super cooling ability. And we think that's due to sort of, um, you know, basically fortifying the, the hemolymph with um, mainly with, we think, small organic compounds, um, which, which stop them freezing, stop ice forming. And they can do that in some cases down to about minus eight, minus nine degrees. Although some insects can go lower. Some of these Arctic terrestrial insects can go even lower. But we think that's another sort of way in which they can cope with uh, these sort of, in this case, low temperatures. Uh, yeah, so are there any more questions? Uh, there's one more about yeah. Arms race. So, it's, so should uh, I read it out? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so the question is, sexual arms race seems very counterintuitive. So if females have mutations that cause them to mate less, then those genes won't get spread in its offspring. So I don't know. Ah, which that, question that, is. Okay. That, that would be because the number of matings a female needs in inverted commas during its lifetime is much lower than to, for, to maximize its reproductive output is much lower than it is for males so a female in the case of these beetles a female theoretically at least would only need to mate with one male to fertilize all her eggs so and, and the thing is if um, one might expect that by mating with uh, uh, more than one male, a female can introduce more genetic variation in her offspring. So that might be to an advantage. But what we think happens is there comes a point with females where the cost of mating outweighs that advantage. And so it gets to the, because mating is relatively costly for females in terms of this sort of energetic cost of carrying the male and being denied access to the surface. That means that male, the, the optimum number of matings for females is lower than the optimum number of matings for males. 
So a male could mate with many, many females, and they would, over, over a wide range of numbers, it would still increase his reproductive output. Whereas a female, it doesn't add anything, and it potentially adds a physiological cost. So absolutely, if a female became so rough and so resistant to a male that she never mated, those genes would go extinct. But there's this sort of balance point between the, the different drivers, we think, which gives you this kind of this kind of evolution. And, and the limits to these kind of the elaboration of these structures, the limits to the evolution of these structures will obviously be if females become so rough that no male can attach is, that's not going to go anywhere. If a female becomes so rough that she's not hydrodynamic anymore, that again is going to be counterproductive. And with the males, these suckers, if they get so, if they continue to evolve them bigger and bigger and, and sort of more and more of them, it actually makes it hard for them to walk around on the bottom of the pond or on plants. They actually get stuck to things. So we think there's sort of always these kind of trade-offs between the different sort of things, yeah? Uh, uh, can you ask the question or should I go ahead? Oh, okay. I, I, have, I have one more question. Uh, so are these uh, water beetles uh, sensitive or uh, quite robust in terms of their survival? For instance, if there is an oil spill or some pollutants, are they? Yeah. Not most, species of, most species are very sensitive. Right. So things like oil spills, practically everything will be affected um, mm -hmm. because um, in, in the vast majority of cases, for example, they have to surface for air and that will mm -hmm. cause problems. Also, the chemicals that come out of the oil have direct, as you know, have direct toxic effects. Mm -hmm. Salt, there are some species which, are, which live in salt very, very salty environments, places mm -hmm. where there's actually saturated salt, you know, salt crystallizing out, but they're mm -hmm. specialists for that environment. So mm -hmm. generally, they're, generally they're quite sensitive. Um, mm -hmm. And they're sensitive to, to quite subtle changes in many cases, like we've seen declines of many of the running water species in mm -hmm. Europe, and we think it's down to changes in the composition of the biofilms that they eat. So, you know, subtle, relatively low amounts of organic pollution can favour certain algae, and we think that's wiping out some of the populations. So, yeah, generally sensitive. Yeah, thank you. It's all right. So, with this, uh, I would like to thank Professor David Britton to have given such an interesting and detailed talk. So, as I said, that uh, such studies and such information is usually not available. Uh, so easily and any information in this regard is extremely helpful so thanks a lot i would also like to thank uh, the members of outside in pavitra for arranging this talk so this basically helps in in outreach of, of such information so uh, we'll have we'll be having a talk by uh, professor kartik next sunday at 11 am on uh, the diversity of uh, freshwater diatoms so I hope to That's see good. you next Sunday also. So thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Professor. Thanks very much. Thanks again for the invite and nice to speak to you all. Thanks.